Hello, Internet. I'm Phil Riley, one of the uh, parents here at the Arts Academy. Uh, I've got two children at the Arts Academy. And um, how's that? Better? Uh, and so anyway, uh, I'm a cardiologist uh, over at Mercy, but today I'm going to speak to you in the capacity of a concerned parent and physician. Um, that's perfect, yeah. Oh, there. And so um, the goal here was to, uh, a couple weeks ago, I reached out and contacted uh, our leadership here at Arts Academy, uh, and I told them I'm happy to get everybody vaccinated, uh, that we could possibly get vaccinated, um, both kids, adult uh, administrators, teachers, um, and there's still some lingering folks who have questions about it. Um, and so I thought maybe this would be an opportunity for us to uh, get together and share some ideas uh, about uh, vaccines. And so uh, I don't know uh, if anybody has any questions, if we can send them over uh, here in the text on Zoom. Uh, but we're also recording on. Um, yeah, there's a Q and A function on Zoom okay. that will allow them to. So there's a that question. Gotcha. So that's probably the best bet. So you can send messages in, uh, questions in on Zoom live. Um, question for question and answer. This is so much better when it's interactive. Uh, not a lot of folks here in person, which I understand it's a pandemic. Um, but I also uh, want to be able to answer any questions that you have. And so um, if you have any live, let us know and we'll get those all answered beforehand. Otherwise, I wanted to tell everybody what I thought uh, would be good information about where this technology came from and where we're going from here. Um, I think that I know in my clinic, a lot of patients have had a lot of um, misconceptions or or didn't understand exactly where this was all coming from. And so I'll try to address the most common themes that I get in my clinic uh, when I'm taking care of my patients. Uh, so a lot of people have told me that they were worried uh, that these vaccines came out too fast and they're just not sure if they're safe. And I also had that, um, that worry um, until I found out exactly how these studies were done. And so uh, for the uh, FDA in the United States to approve a new drug or a new therapeutic, um, they ha we have what's called phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. And anytime we do those, we do those in series, one, two, three, one after the other. Um, and what was different here because of the need uh, to get the vaccine out as fast and safe as possible we did those studies in parallel instead of in series. And so that's one way that they got rid of uh, a lot of the speed and red tape uh, to get these vaccines put in. Um, another thing that um, happened was they're going around the clock on these studies. Uh, they're not doing this for short periods of time during the day with other jobs. Um, these, this research has been going steady ever since it started. And so as from a timing perspective of releasing this and whether or not it's safe, um, I don't have any issues with that. I think that um, the FDA also used to meet two or three times a year uh, at their leisure. Um, and the scientists and physicians that are on those panels uh, could only meet that often. Uh, but they met as soon as the data was available and this sped up the process. Uh, so the previous uh, quickest vaccine from conception to delivery was four years and that was for the month. And so we've really done quite a good job of getting this 
uh, vaccine out quickly. Um, and there hasn't been any uh, change to the way studies are performed. And the reason why that's important is um, we're doing studies uh, the same way from a safety perspective uh, and just doing them in parallel instead of in series, um, this, this helps speed up. The, the point of all of this was that we needed to, uh, we needed to be able to uh, stop all of the studies uh, if any one of the phase one, phase two, or phase three trials showed any uh, evidence of potential harm. And that actually happened uh, to two of uh, the vaccine candidates early on, and I think this was in July. Uh, but the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines um, had no hiccups when they were released, were released early. Um, and so, hello, everybody. If you're joining, please feel free to mute uh, and, and send in any questions that you have. I'm happy to answer them all before we go today. And so, so that's how the speed occurred. That's how we got these vaccines to the market quickly and safely. Uh, so that's one concern that patients in, of mine have in the office. Uh, another concern is, um, well, um, how do they work? Um, how is this technology doing its job and, and where is it coming from and, and that sort of thing. And so the, a lot of the newer uh, technologies in medicine um, are helping our immune systems fight diseases. And we call these new medicines biologics. And these, uh, that term really means that we're helping boost the immune system to fight something that's foreign. And um, I always tell folks about uh, a chemotherapy that came out about seven years ago called Keytruda. And although that's not an RNA vaccine, um, or even an RNA technology, it's a important uh, advance in cancer treatment through immunolo immunologic uh, ways. And so we would give them a, uh, this, this medication actually helps us um, fight stage four lung cancer, which when I was in training in medical school, um, that uh, stage four lung cancer was a six month diagnosis um, of mortality. You had a life expectancy of six months. And now if your immune system works with this medicine called uh, Keytruda, if that cancer cell uh, can be killed with your immune system using this medicine, patients are living over seven years, uh, which is incredible. And so we're influencing the body's immune system to attack these foreign cells or their cancer cells. And so in the, in the setting of um, mRNA vaccines, we're actually training uh, cells to uh, find the foreign spike proteins from this um, coronavirus. And actually our cells make those uh, spike proteins so that the body can recognize them as foreign right away. And um, I actually pulled up some um, graphics to help us understand. This. And so, I don't know, is, is this what we're showing? Yeah, showing. Okay, good. You're, you're perfect. And so, um, so this is a, a simplified diagram of the coronavirus and those little red spikes are the spike proteins. And that's actually how the virus attaches and becomes infectious in, in the backs of our noses, um, what's called the nasal pharynx. And so right away uh, in January, um, it, um, Scientists in China actually figured out the RNA um, um, code uh, for the coronavirus and then figured out quickly where these spike proteins uh, lied within that RNA coding. And so we, we knew uh, that once we figured that out, uh, we could start using this for uh, COVID mRNA vaccines, which has been in studies um, for a few years for things like HIV. Um, I think it was also Ebola. Um, and so there are different um, ways that this has already been used in the past. Um, and so once we could get that mRNA into our cells, um, 
if we could just figure out how to do that, then hopefully we could produce these fine protons. One of the, the biggest technology breakthroughs for this uh, kind of um, uh, vaccine was that we figured out how to make cholesterol bubbles, is how I want you to remember it. All of our cells are made of cholesterol walls. And if we could figure out a way to have cholesterol bubbles merge with those cell walls, um, then whatever we put inside that cholesterol uh, bubble would actually be incorporated into the cell itself. And so, so that's actually what they've done. And um, it's synthetic RNA, it's synthetic cholesterol. And what ends up happening to your cell is it looks just like there's a little patch on the outside, but the RNA gets to the inside of the, vessel, of the cell. Um, and then whenever that um, occurs and that merges to the wall, um, this is a great little um, drawing. Uh, what, what happens is that mRNA works like a credit card through a credit card reader through one of the parts of the cells called a ribosome. And ribosomes make proteins. And so that mRNA credit card reader called a ribosome takes that mRNA that we just put inside the cells with the vaccine um, and we give our own cells that information to create these new spike proteins. And they come together uh, and form the spike for the uh, coronavirus. Um, that part is not infectious. That's the part of uh, the coronavirus itself that actually attaches to our cells. So that's the first part that the body sees so that we can create an immune response. And now that we can find that it's foreign, um, that spike protein gets exposed uh, on the edge of the cell wall to our immune system. And this is how um, our immune system learns the memory of what the spike protein looks like. And so whenever that spike protein uh, is um, finally installed in our uh, cellular memory, in immunologic memory, uh, then we can recognize it as soon as we see it in the environment. And so what does that really mean? So once you're fully vaccinated uh, with the COVID vaccine, um, then anytime that you're uh, at the Arts Academy or downtown Rogers or over at Crystal Bridges, um, if somebody has COVID and they don't know it and they're breathing the air that you're sharing, um, as soon as a viral protein, um, a virus itself, sorry, gets into the back of your nose, um, then your body can see it, recognize it instantly before that virus can start replicating itself inside your body. And so in that way, we're protecting the body uh, from the COVID infection. And uh, we've done a really good job uh, with these vaccines and being able to do that. Uh, and so that's actually how it works. And I think it's important for everybody to understand a little bit um, about the nature of what we're trying to do here. Um, this RNA doesn't go into, uh, into your nucleus, uh, at least not with the um, uh, Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. Uh, so therefore it has no exposure whatsoever to your DNA. That's one of the questions that I get all the time uh, from patients. They want to know if uh, this changes your DNA, and the answer is no. Um, the J&J &J vaccine uh, is a little bit different. It doesn't have the cholesterol um, bubble. They actually incorporated that into something called an adenovirus. Um, and so adenovirus has DNA, uh, and they incorporated this RNA strain into that DNA. So the way that J&J &J works is that it actually infects you with an, um, a neutered, basically, um, adenovirus that then inserts the RNA into your cells, uh, DNA in your cells. And so it doesn't get replicated, doesn't change your DNA or anything else. Um, there, I also at, get asked a few times a week uh, whether or not there's any microchips in the vaccine and there's not. Um, and every time I get asked that, I, I have a little joke and I tell patients that, you know, I had the vaccine myself, one in each arm, uh, the booster two, and, um, and only every now and then does my arm just suddenly point to the 5G tower. Um, and so, uh, and sometimes I get a twitch and it's because what's his name from Microsoft, Bill Gates is talking to my ear, but, but I'm just joking. It doesn't really happen. Um, and uh, there's also no GPS tracking. Uh, I've had patients ask me about that. And uh, um, 
so yeah, there's not a lot of uh, that nefarious stuff going on. Um, the reason why I reached out, I was excited about um, uh, getting everybody uh, who wants to be vaccinated, vaccinated. Um, I, uh, the facility I work at, I can actually um, write appointments uh, for getting vaccinated. And so I'm more than happy to help anybody uh, the Arts Academy that needs to get uh, a vaccine, uh, we can get them an appointment and just email me uh, and I'll make it happen. Um, and so 16 and up, um, uh, we've, we've been given clearance by the uh, FDA to uh, vaccinate any, any American now, um, 16 and up uh, for the COVID vaccine. Um, and so uh, if you're 16 to 18 and you need, uh, you will need a adult um, consent uh, and you'll need to have an adult present in order to get your vaccine here in Northwest Arkansas, uh, but that shouldn't be too hard. Um, and then they're doing studies right now uh, from 12 to 16, uh, and I think those will be released in May. And so hopefully before the beginning of next school year, we can have everybody vaccinated before they return to school. Um, and so, is there one question so far? Yeah, one question. That'd be awesome. Okay, so if you couldn't hear that, uh, we're going to, going to look into getting a vaccine clinic here on campus. Um, I will tell you that um, our vaccine uh, site down at um, Springdale Mercy, we're vaccinating over a thousand people a day. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty robust program and we're uh, very excited to be able to get it to everybody. And there isn't a lack of doses. So, Anybody that wants it uh, can certainly go get it. Um, and so I, I think that's. Uh, there was another question. Sure. Go ahead and unmute your phone. Mr. Ola. If I can ask a question, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yes. My question is uh, related to the. Uh, JJ, uh, yeah. you know, it was suspended, but I wonder if you, do you know if it's going to be, uh, uh, they're going to do it again? for the Because uh, uh, I prefer that one. Yeah, so um, I think that it's fine. Uh, it will be, uh, I think there was only a pause for two weeks as they collected more data uh, around the nation to see about this. So the, um, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, the, a short story about the J and J, if you don't mind. Um, but the the thing that they were worried about was blood clots that are actually a special blood clot in the vein in your head, right here in the middle, um, and it's called a cerebral venous uh, thrombosis. And it was a headache, um, and um, six people have died from it. Uh, and so, or one person died, six people have had it, is what I think actually happened. And so, um, so that's why they paused it. The, the chances, I actually wrote this down the other day for a different purpose, but I still have it in my phone. Um, the chances of um, dying from that blood clot, from the J&J &J vaccine, are 0.00000009%. Extremely low. Uh, and so the, um, um, yeah, I, I definitely think the J&J &J, uh, is going to be available again. We, to my knowledge in Northwest Arkansas, have not, have not given uh, any J&J &J, uh, because we've only had Moderna and Pfizer available for administration. Uh, and, and unless, Katie, do you know of anybody who, who's giving that out? Oh, no, who's giving out the J&J &J around here? Yeah, I haven't heard of anybody. Mm. And okay. so, I'm sorry I'm getting all that TV feedback. How about yeah. this? Is that better? 
Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, and so I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, and well, one last question related to the JJ one. Yeah. Uh, I, I heard that is like more, um, that one is like less chemical, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know if uh, do you know about it. What do you mean? Like, it's like this more natural, like uh, the components um, um, are more natural and that's why uh, the, um, that's why it's just like 70% uh, um, secure, no, like 70% uh, protection of uh, virus. Yeah, so and to answer that, I want to give you a little bit longer uh, answer, if that's okay with you. Uh, and so whenever we talk about what the study showed us uh, was that uh, what it protects us from is death from COVID or severe COVID requiring hospitalization, okay? That's actually what the virus actually does. That was the outcome of the trial. Uh, and so, um, so we need to keep that in mind when we're thinking about how effective uh, these viruses are, uh, these vaccines are. And so the J&J, &J, um, there's a couple different reasons why we think that it wasn't as good because it was a one shot. And they, the company decided to do a one shot and done situation. Um, and in the phase one trials of the Moderna uh, and uh, Pfizer vaccines, uh, they're, they're dose finding trials. Um, and so giving that booster shot actually gave your immune system a little bit more robust reaction uh, to the uh, COVID virus. And so in fact, um, Moderna uh, and Pfizer are talking about what's next for them uh, and they think that a, a three-shot series actually may be even more protective. I don't know how you can get a whole lot better than um, the mid to high 90s percent, uh, but uh, that's what they're talking about. And so I think the effectiveness uh, has to do less with how the RNA is delivered, um, but more along the lines of how much exposure your body's immune system is getting so that it can react appropriately over time. And so uh, it's not really natural that uh, the J and J actually incorporated it into a virus to infect your cells. Uh, so that's not really, you know, none of it's natural, uh, but that's the nature of vaccines. Um, and so, and the difference between these vaccines and other vaccines is we used to take viruses and attenuate them, meaning we would make them less effective or less infective. Uh, and then that way it didn't kill us whenever we exposed it with a vaccination. Um, and so, that's also not really natural, uh, but, uh, but that's how that works. And, and I wouldn't be as nervous about um, whether or not it's natural or not, as opposed to how effective it is. But to be honest with you, all of the vaccine candidates so far are extremely effective. Um, our flu vaccine, for instance, is usually in the mid 50s, uh, as far as being able to keep us from getting um, the flu. And so, uh, the effectiveness of the flu is actually pretty low. Um, and uh, so these are super vaccines. Uh, they, they work better than any vaccine we've ever had um, because of the nature of how it causes our immune system to react. Um, so that was a long answer, but I hope that's helpful. Yeah, thank you. Okay. We have another question from Ms. Heather Lane. Um, how long does the vaccine last? After the booster. That's a great question. Common side effects in 16, 16 to 18 year olds. And what is the efficacy? Okay, so let's start first. Um, the question was um, how, long does, how long does the vaccine last? And we don't know. Um, and so uh, we, it was, if you weren't in the study, uh, the first time the vaccine was released to the public was actually in December. And so we have six month data now telling us that uh, the six month. Uh, we're protected for the first six months for sure. Uh, and so over at the hospital, we got our vaccines, you know, right, at, right in December. Um, and uh, so we're kind of leading that charge uh, here at all the hospital employees. And so, um, so yeah, this, uh, as the data that we know so far is six months. I totally anticipate having, um, having to have booster shots. And, and I'll, Tell you why that's important, if I can. Uh, what, what makes this technology groundbreaking is that 
through a computer. We can actually code the RNA. Uh, since it's synthetic, we can actually make it happen. We can write the RNA code uh, to put in the vaccine, whatever we want to put in it. And what I think is gonna happen, and this is just Phil Riley talking, this isn't anybody else talking, this is just my opinion, which take it with a grain of salt, because I'm a cardiologist. Uh, but I think that um, what's gonna happen is, is we're all gonna get boosters, probably once a year. Uh, and, but the cool part of this is that they're going to be able to code the new variants, uh, which is another question that I get all the time, which is, um, how, um, how are we going to do with the variants? There's one, a major one from South Africa. There's one from Brazil. Um, there's one from California. Um, how are we going to deal with that? And does that make the vaccine more or less effective? And so, um, the answer is we don't really know. Uh, we do know, uh, based on the timing of when the studies were performed and the surge from last, uh, winter, uh, that, um, the, during the trial, that surge was happening in a couple of these vaccine candidates, and they did well. Um, and so the Moderna and Pfizer uh, vaccines came out in, um, before the surge, and were still super effective. And so I think that uh, the cool part uh, of this discussion is that they're going to be able to code those variants into the booster shot. And I totally see this as being something that um, is going to be like the flu. And in fact, to be honest, I think they're going to end up being able to take the flu, code it into the booster shot, and cure us with the, uh, for the flu too. Um, and I can totally see that happening with the technology the way it is. And um, I saw there was a phase two trial three weeks ago for HIV. Um, that was 98% effective mRNA vaccine. So totally crazy. Um, it's not going to surprise me. And I tell my patients this, uh, in the clinic, I think that this technology has the potential to be as important to humans as electricity. And that seems like a big statement. And I totally feel that that's the case. Um, because I think that if we can get rid of infectious diseases, we're going to uh, live longer and healthier because a lot of um, what makes us die younger and die of diseases is what we do to ourselves and what happens to us from an infectious disease perspective. And so if we can live healthy with a good diet and exercise and get rid of infectious disease, I think my kids' kids, or maybe my kids' grandkids, uh, will probably live to 120, 150 years old, free of disease. And how crazy is that? Um, and so that's all opinion from Phil Riley. Take it with a grain of salt, but I think that's how important this stuff is. And so the other part of the question was uh, common side effects in 16 year olds. Yeah, common side effects in 16 to 18 year olds. Um, let's talk about side effects of the uh, vaccine. Um, when you get the vaccine, they put it in your arm. Uh, probably about six hours later, you start having a little bit of discomfort in your arm. Um, it feels like Here's what it felt like to me. It felt like when I was in high school and I used to play slug with somebody uh, and I got a bruise, that's what it felt like. Um, and I kid with my patients, I had, to, I had to come up to the keyboard and put my arm up on the deal like this by putting it up there, because it hurt. Uh, but that lasted for about 24 hours. Um, and then after the second booster um, shot, after the second shot, uh, we do see this. And in fact, Moderna uh, in their trial measured it. 75% uh, of patients after the second shot had some feelings of fatigue, headache, uh, arm pain. Um, and these last about 36 hours and then they go away. It's, like, it's almost like a light switch, it goes away. Uh, but you, you'll notice those side effects. Now, what about specifically the question of 16 to 18 year olds? I think they get it too. Uh, I don't think that there's going to be uh, much difference. It, to be honest, the reason why it happens in the first place is it's a reaction of your immune system ramping up to fight something that's new and foreign to it. And so it's actually a good thing that we're having those side effects. Um, and so I, I hope that helps answer your question. And I think the last part of the question is just generally what the efficacy Oh, the efficacy. Uh, yeah, I, I hope that I covered that. Um, um, we're getting 
we're getting you know mid to high 90s as far as preventing death and preventing severe infection that causes hospitalization. Um, and let me take that in a step further. What that doesn't say is it doesn't say that just because I get this, I'm not going to be able to get it in the community. Okay? If I get the vaccine, there's still a chance that we get it in the community. But whenever we do get it, uh, it's a very mild form of the disease. Uh, it doesn't cause hospitalization. Um, and uh, there is some data in smaller studies now saying that the vaccines are actually decreasing transmission, which is awesome. So if I get a viral particle in the back of my nose, my body takes care of it. And maybe it's not replicating so that I can transmit it to somebody else. But that's actually why we're still wearing masks, uh, particularly indoors, unless I'm six feet away from people, which is good. Um, and so, so I, I think that outside, if you've been vaccinated, um, the chances of you getting uh, COVID are extremely low. Uh, so I know the CDC isn't going there and the television stations this morning on TV news uh, were all up about the mask question outside. And to be perfectly honest, I think uh, being outside uh, with your mask off around, especially people who've also been vaccinated, is going to be fun. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Um, one, of, one of our attendees asked, I've had several parents say to me, we don't even get the flu vaccine. Why would we get the COVID vaccine? You talk a little bit about the importance of this vaccine as it relates to the danger this virus presents. Yeah, so this this the reason why this vaccine is so important in the first place is um, we we see so much death from it and uh, the illness that it caused or early on uh, before we had any treatments whatsoever was extremely horrible. Uh, your blood sugar would go up. Your uh, you'd have young people have strokes. Uh, we started seeing that early on last summer um, where they were otherwise very healthy. They came in having strokes. Um, and the, uh, the infection of COVID actually causes a hypercoagulable state, which is a fancy term for your blood can stick in a clot. Uh, and so we would see, and I saw this a lot, still see it, uh, blue toes. We call them COVID toes. And what it is is lack of blood flow um, in the extremities. Um, and this is due to a hypercoagulable state. Whenever it, it's important to understand that uh, this virus, whenever it infects tissues, it causes inflammation. And so it causes inflammation of the lung, it's called pneumonia. And it causes inflammation of the heart, we call that myocarditis. Um, whenever it causes inflammation in your brain, we call it cerebritis. And so wherever it infects the body is where it causes inflammation and therefore the inflammation um, is associated with the symptoms of the disease. And so um, it happens in your entire body. And the folks who get it the worst, um, it's unlike anything we've seen. Um, and uh, it's, that in that way, it's so much different from the flu uh, that it's important to recognize those differences. This is a totally different beast. Um, and we don't have 565,000 patients dying from the flu every season. This is not the flu. Uh, and so it's, um, it's unfortunate that it's been um, compared to the flu, uh, no worse than the flu. It is totally not that. Uh, so that's what we've seen in the field. Uh, that's what we've seen in our clinics. Um, and that's why this vaccine is so important. Uh, and so um, I don't know, if, I hope that answers. Do we have a goal for the percentage we're trying to get vaccinated? And so, um, as close to 100% would be awesome. Uh, but um, I think what that question comes to is uh, what about this whole herd immunity thing? Uh, and I want everybody to recognize that we don't have herd immunity as a common cold. We still get it, right? All of us get the common cold, but yet we don't have herd immunity to it because I still get it, right? And we're not going to get herd immunity. And we don't get herd immunity to the flu. And so that is a concept that is uh, not something that really even applies here. Uh, and so, uh, so 
So herd immunity uh, is something that we need to really quit talking about because I still see it on the news too, and it just drives me crazy uh, because it's not going to happen. Uh, as you can tell by watching the news, these variants are actually due to mutations of the viral RNA. And that's all the virus does. It replicates 2 billion times in each body. And every time it replicates, there's a chance that it changes. There's a chance that it mutates. Uh, and when those mutations replicate themselves, that's how these um, strains change over time. So we use a term called endemic whenever we can't get rid of an, a new infectious, emerging infectious disease, whenever it's something that is never going to go away, we call that endemic. And COVID is endemic now. Uh, too many people have been infected and we're never, ever going to get rid of it. Um, and so uh, I think it's important to see that. I think it's also, and just recognize it and saying these things out loud helps us all prepare for what's coming. Uh, and I think that uh, the flu, it's endemic. It's never going away. Um, and so the only way we can get rid of disease is through vaccination. We almost did it with polio. Um, we all, we were pretty good at the childhood infectious diseases until we started thinking about not vaccinating our kids. And, um, and that's not a tangent I want to go off on, but those diseases are coming back because we're not vaccinating everybody. And so, um, so the importance of this discussion is that uh, the closer to 100% we can get, the less people are dying. I saw this this morning. 7,600 people got COVID yesterday in this country. Yesterday. And we're getting over it. Uh, and so we're, we're getting to the end of the road uh, with this uh, disease, but we're not there yet. And so indoors, wear your mask um, and keep yourself out of the hospital and keep your loved ones from dying. You need to be getting vaccinated, all of us. And that's really why I'm here, is to try to educate you about everything uh, that I know of so that we can um, all be on the understanding that we have a common goal and we're never gonna be able to achieve as good a result unless we all participate. Um, so I hope that helps. Final question we have is, I have several families that are wanting to get the vaccine, but are concerned about the paperwork required to do so. Uh, oh. Can you please let us know what is needed Sign up for the vaccine. Yeah, so um, good question. How can I get signed up for the vaccine? Um, worried about the paperwork involved. What do we need to do? Uh, how can we actually physically make that happen? What is involved uh, is the question. And so if you've ever been to Mercy, I can just sign you up and there's no paperwork other than when you show up, you have to uh, tell them that you not currently pregnant and um, haven't had a recent vaccination and have never had a life-threatening reaction to a vaccination, and then you get your shot. Uh, so that, that's about as extensive as it is. If you have never been to Mercy, because I'm a Mercy physician, uh, so that's what I can speak to, uh, but if you've never been to Mercy, I can tell you exactly, I don't know if you can put this on the screen, uh, I can tell you exactly how to a uh, call to set up an appointment. There's a, no, there's actually a number. And so I'm gonna see if I can show you this. So that's a free 1-800 number. It's 8336, uh, sorry, 364-6777. Uh, and so, uh, and that's actually the website too, mercy.net vaccine. Uh, and so they have little cards. I just took a photo of it and I, I share that, uh, texting it to people uh, if they want. Uh, but that's literally all that there is, uh, is a one page piece of paper. And all we really care about is uh, whether or not you have reasons to not give you the vaccine due to your health. Um, another question I get asked is, um, hey, Dr. Riley, I've got, uh, I've got lupus or I've got an, another autoimmune disease. Can I take the vaccine? And the answer is yes. Uh, if you, you're not having a current flare, the answer is yes. Um, if you're having a current flare, you should probably talk to your rheumatologist. Uh, hey, Dr. Riley, I've got cancer. 
can I get the vaccine? And the answer is yes. Uh, certain kinds of cancers, though, will make the immune response um, less robust. And so the effectiveness of the vaccine may be more limited uh, with certain kinds of cancer. But the answer is yes. Um, I've talked to colleagues in every specialty, um, except OB. And so if you're pregnant, don't get COVID vaccine, because I don't know what that will be. Uh, I think it'll be fine, to be honest with you, because we're influencing the immune system. We're not causing damage to anybody's organs. Um, but I don't know if it crosses the placental barrier. So um, we'll talk to your OB doctor. Um, oh, sure. Eight three 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 six four six seven seven or mercy.net forward slash vaccine v a c c i n e. Um, and so uh, I think that um, there's just about no reason why medical reason. Uh, can you repeat that? Uh, there's just about no medical reason why you shouldn't get the vaccine. And so I just saw that pop up. I think it was from my wife um, that uh, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends vaccinating when? In pregnant and breastfeeding women. So there you go. That's the, that's all, all. All of those guys and gals get together and uh, your OB doctors or your gynecologists, they get together once a year and they have science, share all their science and share all their recommendations and, and they recommend getting the vaccine. So news to me, I learned something. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, so that's awesome. Yeah, I, I really don't know of anybody who can't get the vaccine, uh, but if you're worried about it, you should call your doctor. Uh, I would say that if you have a tendency towards a thicker blood, um, there are different diseases that cause that, you might want to ask your doctor first uh, before you get the J&J &J particularly, uh, since it causes a blood clot in the top of the head. Um, so that may not be a bad idea. Um, and so I think I've covered most of the things that people uh, get uh, have questions about. I'm not okay, that's a great question. Um, right, I haven't covered it all, <laughs> and so uh, so we get um, we get patients asking, "Hey, man, I had COVID, so I have natural immunity, um, so I don't want to get the COVID back." Um, let me tell you about natural immunity. Uh, so we think that it waxes and or sorry, it wanes. It it goes away um, after about three months. And so we've seen multiple people in the hospital have COVID twice uh, or more. Uh, and we've, we've, there's been a couple of patients that were severely ill enough to actually get COVID and uh, be placed on the ventilator more than once. And so what we initially thought was the more severe your disease is, uh, the higher the immune response that you're gonna have, which is why you heard about people sharing their plasma if they've been infected. And so, so it turns out that we just can't predict who's gonna have that uh, immune response and who's not. And so if you've had COVID, you need to get a vaccine too because the vaccine produces a more robust uh, immune reaction to native COVID infection. And so I think that um, there is a recommendation about whether or not uh, we should have the COVID vaccine immediately or wait three months. And I don't know that there's a consensus about that yet. Uh, maybe Kara can tell us in the comments, but, um, but that's typically what we tell people is let's wait three months and get you vaccinated. Um, and because we really don't want you to get it more severely. There is also something called an inoculum, which is the amount of uh, vaccine viral particles, sorry, not vaccine, but viral particles that infect you. So if your inoculum is higher because you, slept in the same room with an infected person overnight, and you're sharing the same air over and over all night long, that the higher your inoculum, the higher likelihood you are to have severe disease. Um, and so 
when we're passing by each other um, outdoors, the inoculum you're going to get from share to air is going to be extremely low and not repetitive over and over. And so, um, so keep in mind that um, just because you had a mild case of COVID doesn't mean you've amount, you have mounted a strong, robust immune response. Uh, and that's why everybody should be vaccinated, even if you've had COVID. You're, but I'll concede that uh, we don't know the right answer as far as when. We tell a lot of folks uh, uh, to wait three months. I will also say that we found a little bit uh, of a relationship. This is the Riley opinion, uh, not uh, science fact yet, that it seems like uh, patients have more severe side effects to the COVID vaccine if they take the a vaccine immediately within a month uh, of having the infection. So for what that's worth, that goes along with waiting three months after you've had COVID before you have the vaccine. And the consensus trend of thought is 90 days. There is not a month of work. Yeah. And did I cover that, Katie? Uh, did you have anything else? Okay. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm pretty good in the room, uh, but whenever everybody's virtual, man, this is hard. Uh, so all these teachers at the uh, Arts Academy doing virtual, man, total respect. Uh, you guys are amazing. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it, it, happy to answer any questions. Uh, feel free to email us uh, here at the Arts Academy, and um, they will email me if I've got answers. I'll I'll get them to you, and if I don't, I'll look it up or ask other experts, and we'll get we'll get you taken care of. The point is, is that this is our little community, and I want to be here to help anybody uh, that I can help. Uh, and I know that my wife, Kara, who's on the board here, um, uh, school board, uh, is feels the same way. And so, if there's anything we can do to help get anybody vaccinated, answer any other questions that may uh, be causing you to pause. Um, by all means, feel free to take advantage of free healthcare opinions because uh, I'm happy to give it uh, to the extent that I know it. And I'll tell you when I don't know the answer. Um, and if I do know it, then I'll let you know. Um, anybody else giving us any? No, I think all right. that's it. Other than uh, congratulations and thanks uh, from Susan Burroughs, McGinnis, everyone on the call. All right. Thank you for doing this for us. And man, I'm happy to help. And everybody have a good day. And Thank you. We'll see you later. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.